The code base I've built so far is nice, but it's a little under-equipped for where I'm going next. I also have some new constraints on the code base now that I know a little bit more about the medium term trajectory. And so there are some changes I want to make in how I structure the code base. So upgrading the code base to its new 2023 iteration is the topic of today's video. My first move here is going to be to convert the code base from C++ to pure C. My original reasoning to write the code base in C++ was to make it a universal receiver. That is, I wanted it to be easy to have any dependency be in C or in C++. However, there is one big downside to that approach, which is that compiling C++ is harder than compiling C. And I'd like to be able to write my own compiler that compiles my code someday. So switching my code to C now is going to make that goal easier. There's a big wrinkle in this plan though, which is that now C++ dependencies are going to have to be compiled separately and linked in after the compilation. And those dependencies won't be within reach of my own C compiler even after I've got one. So this is just a limitation I'm going to have to accept. And I'm going to try to minimize the C++ dependencies, but it turns out I already have one, which is my D3, D11 layer. So while I'm doing the conversion, I do already have a test case for how to solve the C++ dependency problem ready to go. Along the way, I do some other cleanups. I clean up some stuff in the base layer types and the style that I've used everywhere. Mostly this is just deleting stuff that I'm not really using or switching to a style that I come to prefer over the last year, little things like that. Next up, I'm dealing with my code base's system for managing errors and logs. I put a system in for error strings a while back, and it turned out to be quite underpowered for a lot of use cases. In particular, it only really supported static strings for errors, but some paths want to produce errors with formatting or variable lengths, so that was an issue. The scope for this error system is that it should help me write code that avoids crashing when something fails, and it should give me an easy way to gather information about the point of failure. It's not suited for every situation where something is called error information, and that's okay. It's mostly meant for APIs that I already have in my code base, like window and graphics setup, file loading, font baking, those kinds of things. All these cases are places where failures do sometimes happen, or can in theory, and if a failure happens, it's often easy to solve the failure if I just send the right information through a message up the chain and eventually display it to a user at the right location or at the right time. It's possible to think up uh, more complicated cases where gathering a rich information from multiple pieces of context is important, and I'm not trying to solve anything like that. This is just about how the error information gets set aside and gathered up and used later. I rely on a few observations to guide the design of this error system. First, the user doesn't want to see error output explicitly in the types of the APIs they use because that kind of API explodes the work that they are responsible for when they begin composing functions that can produce errors. I've got an example of what I mean on the screen where there are ifs in between functions all over the place. What they want to see is that the function is typed to always return something that they can pass along safely, and I call that kind of API an error-free API. Second, the user code wants to be able to look at error messages and get them to the right observer eventually. It's not good enough to just have a null handle that knows that an error occurred. I'm going to need to be able to carry something like a simple string from the point of failure to the final observer. 
the easiest way I can think of to make an API that gives the user code both of these first two constraints that it wants is to have an API that doesn't explicitly return errors, but that accumulates error information as a side effect. And that's a pretty typical pattern in some error systems. So I guess this pair of constraints maybe is why. The third observation that guides this design is about what the implementers see. So when an implementer goes to write a function and that function needs to produce error information, I want to consider their perspective and what I see there gives me my third constraint. So sometimes an implementer wants to rely on other APIs that may also be error producers. And then what, what happens matters. Sometimes what they want to do is let the error from the API they're using percolate up to another user up the chain. Sometimes what they want is they want to intercept the error from the API that they're using and then do something relevant with that, maybe store it away in a log or react to it and handle the case with a or handle the problem with a different code path, something like that, but then hide it from the user. And then another thing that happens sometimes is they want to intercept it, um, understand that an error occurred, but also pass it up the chain so that other users Want it. Those are the three combinations of what they might want to do if they are using an API that already produces errors. So this is the basic idea behind a system like exceptions with try and catch blocks. They let you say, hey, I want to handle errors here, but also I might also want to throw errors up the chain. But I don't want to use exceptions for a couple of reasons. Obviously, there's no built-in exceptions in C anyways. But the bigger issue really is that the exception system exempts the API implementers from having to return something at all. When you throw an exception, you don't end up having to return something. But that actually violates my error-free property. I want an API where I'm guaranteed to get something back and that something is safe to pass along. That is an error-free API. And that makes it much easier to write code that is predictable because every time I call a function, I know it's going to happen. That function is not going to throw. It's going to return, and it's going to return something that I can immediately pass along to another call. That is the property I want. So an exception system wouldn't do this anyways. But the try-catch part of an exception system is kind of what the implementer wants to be able to sometimes catch errors locally and sometimes let them go up the chain. Informed by these observations, the error system I eventually set up has the following structure. I have a begin end pair for setting up ranges of error accumulation. So user code can use this to decide when they will handle errors. And these ranges can also be nested so that any code can be an implementer and a user or one or the other, both at the same time, all that stuff. Then there's a function for emitting errors. Errors are accumulated as a side effect on a per thread basis so that this can run on multiple threads without having to do any interlocking. And the accumulation rule that I chose for the system restricts it to only remembering the first non-empty error string that it sees in each begin and range. Here I transform the code throughout my code base to rely on this new error system and it turns out I'm pretty happy with how it all comes together. A lot of previously ugly interfaces that were explicitly handling error accumulation get eliminated, and it lets me rewrite all of my APIs in an error-free style and consolidates all of the error reporting code into just a couple of places in the code base. For the logging system, I decide to just apply the exact same design again. The only major difference is that in this one, log strings are accumulated by concatenating them together rather than taking the first non-empty string. Besides that, I have the nestable begin and pair for users to create accumulation ranges and the emit function for implementers to record log information. Next, I turn to upgrading my arena. It's currently a fixed capacity reserve commit arena. That means I can make each arena quite big and I still only pay the price for the memory that I'm actually using, but I can't grow my arena. And if I had an infinite address space, this would be perfect. I would never need to do anything else. 
But in reality, as I start to use arenas for smaller things like per thread error and log memory, I start to get a little worried that I'm actually going to suffer from overusing my reserve space. The upgrade here is to set up an arena with a chained growth structure. I'm actually able to merge these together. So for cases where I want to start with a smaller reserve and grow to fit demand, I just reserve new chunks from the OS and chain them onto the arena's chunk chain. Uh, but I don't have to do that. I can also disable growth and just start with a very large reserve so I can have a single arena type that dynamically scales to different use cases. While this chaining thing is more costly than a normal push, it doesn't actually trigger unless I'm overrunning the space available in the arena, and the overhead is very small for arenas that don't need to grow. That's it for upgrades to my base layer. Next up, I want to equip the code base with some important development tools. Things like profiling, debugging, and testing aids. First here, I take a crack at setting up profiling in my code base. Instrumenting profilers are nice for visualizing a program's execution structure and of course are immensely important as performance measurement tools to guide optimization work. So I try to spin up a profile capturing system, but I end up backing off of it doing this upgrade. I know from experience that getting a hand-rolled profiler up and running is possible, but it's a lot of work and probably enough to make an arc of its own. I don't really know why I thought I could cram it in here as a small upgrade, but as I'm working on this and getting stressed about it, I detect my mistake, and after a few hours of grinding on it, I decide to put this upgrade on the shelf for another time. Or at least so I think. By the end, you'll see I come back around and try a different solution to this problem. But for now, let's look at the next bit of code base equipment. The next tool I want to set up in my system is the address sanitizer. And for this, I have to give a big thanks to Martin's Mosaico for giving me the kick in the pants to actually learn the system and start using it. He gave a workshop at the Handmade Boston conference that went over how to set this up and included how to integrate it into a custom allocator like my arena. It became immediately obvious to me watching that talk that turning this thing on for testing is a no-brainer and that I should start doing it everywhere. Setting up the sanitizer is just a matter of setting up some compiler flags and using the supplied memory poisoning API to integrate with my custom allocator. With this enabled, all sorts of mistakes that would normally be silent runtime bugs become explicit runtime errors. It's almost like I have an assert every time a memory access occurs that would be undefined or illegal for any reason. It's really useful. And it was also extremely painless to set up. I'm, I can't believe I wasn't doing it sooner. Such a huge win. On to the next tool. Another tool that Martin's taught us about at the Handmade Boston conference is the LLVM fuzzer. This is a really powerful tool for automating the testing of certain kinds of code. A fuzzer is a program that generates buffers of data and runs them through a test function. The LLVM fuzzer uses a cooperation between the compiler and an external library to do some really incredible stuff. So when I set the flags on Clang to enable fuzzing, it compiles all my code with special instrumentation that allows the fuzzer to see what code paths are exercised every time that it runs through the test function. It will generate buffers for me in a structured, randomized way to search for patterns that exercise as many code paths as possible. In other words, it's automatically generating test data that increases the code path coverage. If it finds a buffer that can cause a crash, it saves the buffer to a file for me, and then I can run through the test function in a debugger with that file as input and step through and see the crash happen. 
Filters are particularly good for testing anything that is already some kind of parser. And the biggest limitation of a fuzzer is that it only helps to catch crashes, at least on its own. It doesn't help to determine if something is correct unless you do some extra work to translate incorrectness into crashes. But it's still going to be a hugely useful tool for the kinds of things I want to be doing in this code base. So another huge win on that one. In addition to setting up the new flow for building a fuzzer, I set up a little space in my codebase file structure for fuzzer output and a nice flow for using all of that. I test the system out on a very thin wave parser setup using the wave parser I wrote a while ago, and it actually uncovers the fact that I didn't actually build the API to be error free. That wasn't something I was doing rigorously before, and so I missed it, and this fuzzer caught it for me. I mean, it was not a particularly hard catch, but it's still a catch. Uh, so cool, it, this whole system's already paying off and all I was trying to do is see if it can fuzz stuff. Big thanks again to Martins for the introduction to these very powerful tools. I know I should probably just make it a habit to study the tools that are available and figure out which ones I want to start using, but having him walk through these and explain exactly how useful they are made it so easy to finally take the step and start using them. If you're seeing this now and like me, you haven't taken the time to learn about address sanitizing and fuzzing with the Clang toolchain, I would highly recommend you just take some time and play with it, learn it, see if it's something you could take advantage of. The final codebase upgrade I want to do is another iteration on my bash build script system. I devoted an entire arc to this a long time ago, and I set it up by copying it from an older iteration of the same system, and then I did some things to try to integrate it and make it a little better. I did a lot of experiments, and some of it did not turn out that well. So with this pass, I want to clean up uh, the cruft that I made when I did it before and see if I can make a few new features along the way. In particular, I want to be able to invoke more than just the compiler with the system. For our first baby step in that direction, I am going to try to make it work with an assembler as well as a compiler. There's not a lot to say about the in-between. You know, I studied the code that was in the scripts, made some design choices, and got new stuff working. By the time I'm done with the whole pass over the system, I'm able to use the Microsoft linker and the Kling linker, both of which were broken for different reasons. And the boilerplate for using the system is simplified. The configuration data for the system is no longer living and in, buried inside the BLD folder. It feels better organized to me now. And uh, as desired, I can run the assembler and the compiler, which has this cool effect that before, if you looked at the way I had set up the project Euler code, I had some assembler code and some C code or C++ code that I converted into C earlier in this arc. And in order to link it together, I had to first build some of it with a compiler, I had to build some of it with the assembler, and that was that had to be two separate lines. One of them could use the build system, and the other one was a direct call to the assembler. And then for the third line, I invoked the linker and put them together with the build system again. Now, with the assembler and the compiler both in there, I can just use a link line and give it both of the sources, the assembler source and the C source, and it automatically figures out which thing to invoke given the file type and chains that together and links the whole thing. Kind of fun. Once again, I end this pass with some notes on things that are still hacky. It's not that there is any regressions or anything like that. It's just that there's a new frontier of problems I'm opening up with this idea of invoking things like the assembler. And so a new set of hacks got left behind for me to pass over next time. And with something like this, that's just the nature of the progress that I make. I make a little bit of progress pushing the boundary and then I use a hack to keep it, you know, just a little bit more functional than it should be, right? I'm, I'm getting a little bit more out of it than what I would if I wasn't willing to hack. But I do leave that hack behind and say, hey, next time you got to fix that so that you can make more progress.
Now, that's where I thought I would stop, but f at the very end here, I decide to take my advice from earlier and go and look at some existing tools that might solve the profiling problem instead of trying to roll my own. And in particular, what I have in mind is that there's this tool coming out of the handmade community called Spall. It's a tracing profiler, exactly like what I was trying to build. In fact, it was sort of what I was trying to recreate myself. But as I was working on it and discovering again how hard it is to do that, I thought maybe for once I should try an external tool, see if Spall is a good fit for me. Right away after downloading it, the UI is more than good enough. It's way better than anything I was going to be able to spin up in between other projects here on the YouTube channel. So that's a good sign. But what about the tracing part? The tracing API from Spall is very lean. The C header containing the API and its entire implementation is less than 500 lines of code. Unfortunately, the comments in the code, the documentation, and examples aren't very good yet. But the creator, Colin, is more than happy to help users get started and takes lots of feedback. With his help, I was able to figure out how to integrate this, and it's really not that big of a deal. It's a very nice, lightweight integration once you know what you're supposed to do. I ended up building a nice switch for turning on and off my manual instrumentation macros. And then I scattered it into a few parts of the base layer to get a capture and test it out. And I'm thrilled that I actually have a profiler up and running after all. It turns out there's also a way to get automatic instrumentation by setting some flags on Clang. And this feature is supposed to work with the small tracing stuff. Using automatic instrumentation would mean I could capture every single function in my whole program without having to manually set the begin and pairs everywhere. Unfortunately, here I'm just not able to get it all to work. There's a little bit of trickiness here with how the automatic instrumentation can cause an infinite stack recursion. It's, it's clear to me how that's possible, but I'm struggling to figure out how to fix it. And so I'm going to just take this idea and put it on the shelf for now. Maybe I'll get some more help on this and maybe the documentation and uh, examples will improve and I'll be able to do this more easily in a future pass. Overall, I would say the Spall idea is a truly great option for me. Its tracing is extremely lightweight. It's so sm such a small amount of code that I have to include into my code base. No, no difficulty with linking or anything like that, just super small. The visualizer, it feels excellent to use. And I have very little concern about the long-term maintenance of any of this. Hopefully, in another pass, I'll be able to get that automatic instrumentation stuff working out and the examples will improve over time. That would all be amazing too, but even without that, this is a major win. And that is it for the 2023 codebase upgrades. Altogether, I've now got a codebase in mostly pure C, a cleaned up error and logging system, growable arenas, address sanitizing, fuzzing, profiling, and a cleaned up build system. I'm feeling very well equipped for the journey that lies ahead, and I'll see you here next time for the beginning of my journey. Bye!